Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. My name is Brian Mosley, and uh, this is uh, actually the second sermon that I've ever given in my life. I was 13 when I gave the first one. I'm quite a bit older than that now. I'm not going to go into exactly how old. Uh, and for all of you who are joining us on video, I uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I will say that I believe whether you're watching today or whether you're watching a year from now, that the words that God is going to provide in this message can change your life. I'm going to start off with a little statement to kind of describe uh, where this message came from today. The, the name of the message is The Road to Emmaus. And this is a, a setting uh, after Jesus had died and uh, He had uh, been put in the tomb. Three days had gone by and uh, He had resurrected. And uh, it reminded me a lot of the, the current events that are going on today and uh, some of the responses that are happening within the church. The New Age of Revelation. Elias Boudinot, a distinguished statesman and clergyman, wrote a book called The Age of Revelation. As a response to the growing tide of skeptic, secular, and atheist opinion of the day, he wrote this book in 1790s the late 1790s. It was in response to uh, powerful men such as Ethan Allen and Thomas Paine, who you may r remember hearing their names. Both were notable figures uh, during the Revolution. Uh, they asserted that reason rather than faith was the course that humankind should adhere. Does that sound familiar? The same spirit has reared its head again and is more prevalent than ever in human history today due to man's logic. They are calling evil good and good evil. As written about in the book of Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. The very identity of being a Christian in this world today has claimed more lives by persecution worldwide in the shortest time frame than ever in history today. Persecution of Christians in America is at its highest known level since the founding of the country. A country founded on Christian principles, Mosaic laws, that's the laws of Moses, Millions of newly born and unborn children are being murdered and their parts are being sold for scientific and logical purposes. And laws are made to protect these actions. Today, the very fabric of our trust in government and elective processes is torn and called into doubt. Terrorism and the rise of false religions has covered the globe on a scale never before seen. We have had a pandemic ravage the world, killing tens of thousands, and it still persists today. Many other things have happened and are happening that most of us never thought we would see in our lifetime. Fear and doubt has gripped the body of Christ distracting us from our purpose. But there is hope. We must know without a doubt that God never reacts to Satan. All of the extreme events are Satan's reaction to the movements of Almighty God today. These extreme unprecedented events that are happening are only a mild reaction by Satan to comparison to the mighty movements of God in the spiritual realm. We must know that God is moving and pay attention to His actions because these extreme events are the evidence of extreme movements of God today. The age of revival the church has experienced before now is what God has graciously offered, but few unprecedented 
but a new unprecedented age has begun, requiring new wine for a new revelation for the quickening of the body of Christ. If we wake up to the call of God, if we call out to Him from our private place, our quiet place, our still place, He will answer our call. And we will be quickened by the revelations that He will bestow upon us. New revelations are being recognized daily across the body of Christ. And they're necessary for the quick works that He is doing all over the world. We are all created for a specific work in God's plan. He molded each and every one of us in our mother's womb for a specific purpose. He knew our names before the creations of the pillars of the earth. He knew that today you would have a purpose. He knew that today the works would need to be done by you for your purposes and for His glory. God is calling up His army in these unprecedented times and we were all made for such a time as this as with the story of Esther. We must know Him intimately by spirit to hear His direction. In this present moment, you are being called up for service. Amen. Do you hear the call? No matter your age, if your heart beats in your chest, if you draw breath, it is your time and you have work to do. The final harvest is approaching. Revelations chapter 14 and Matthew 13 speak of the harvest. God is calling on His body to prepare for this harvest and prepare to do His good works and undo the works of Satan. I'm not afraid to say that. Time is short and we must know the voice of God. Perhaps you need to know Him in a new way. The disciples' reactions after the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Christ remind me of the state of many of these in the church today. Let me encourage you and lift you up by reminding you of Jesus' response to their lack of faith and the things that followed after. We're going to start today in uh, the book of Luke, chapter 24. And it starts with the resurrection. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. And as the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but He has risen. Remember how He spoke to you while He was still in Galilee? saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered His words. Examples of faithlessness. In these passages, the two angels had to remind the women, which were Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, Joanna, and a fourth woman that they didn't name, all who had spent three years with Jesus, who had followed Him and sat at His feet at His teachings, had heard numerous times, 14 to be exact, that He stated about His crucifixion and about His death and about His resurrection. And if you remember, even right before Jesus ascended, He said, you know where I'm going, and you know, and they were like, uh, wait, where are you going? <laughs> he constantly had to remind him. And that's how we feel sometimes today. But their lack of faith and their distraction from the fear and the instances that were happening around them and the loss of their Savior 
had completely taken their faith. They returned to the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. The eleven disciples is what this is referring to, of course. Uh, we're not counting uh, Judas in the mix of that. Now, they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary mother of James, and also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe. Praise the Lord. I'm having to go front to back on some pages, y'all. Excuse me. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. All right. So we're going to go with the monitor. <laughs> Let me put my glasses on. Y'all excuse me. And as they ran back and told the eleven what had happened, like I said, uh, they were uh, scoffed at and said this was nonsense. It was uh, only Peter and John that ran to the tomb. John got there first and he immediately believed. Some of the books don't mention John, but the book of John does in... Uh, 20 uh, verses 1 through 10. John immediately believed. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, and he saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. He was still wondering. Now, keep in mind, Peter, who had denied Christ three times, who he was so distraught about the loss of Jesus. And even after hearing everything that Jesus had said, as the other disciples still wondered if it could possibly be true. Next slide. Peter looked into the tomb. And that's, I've already gone through that. It's the next slide. The road to Emmaus. And behold, two of them were going to a very day to a village named Emmaus. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had been taking place. Uh, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were presented, prevented from recognizing him. Uh, there are three specific things to consider here. First of all, Cleopas and the other disciple, uh, these were two of the 70 disciples, not the original uh, 11 or 12, who may have uh, been his wife because many of the disciples had companions with them and the word companions also meant wives in that uh, original Greek text. And they were uh, instructed to also to always go out in twos never to go out alone due for the obvious reasons. The second thing to consider is the fact that they were on their way out of Jerusalem. It is assumed that Cleopas and his companion lived in Emmaus due to the fact that it was so easy for them to find lodging once they arrived. The Cleopas, Cleopas and his companion had already left Jerusalem and were in complete disbelief to the point that they were already planning and trying to figure out what their next move was going to be. The thought of uh, the teachings of Christ had completely left their minds. They were complaining the entire way and even though they had heard the testimony of the women who came back from the tomb, they still didn't believe. So they had four women who had gone to the tomb, 
who had seen two angels who had been reminded of the words of Jesus Christ come back and testify before them what they had seen, they still left Jerusalem and headed home to Emmaus. Third, they were not able to recognize Jesus even when He walked up and spoke to them face to face. Their faith was gone along with their sight. Jesus said to them, What are these things that you're talking about? And they stood still and said, One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem unaware of the things that have happened here these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and in word and in the sight of God and all of the people, and how the chief priests and other rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Now, Cleopas said to Jesus almost sarcastically is how he spoke to Jesus. It's important to note how he described Jesus. This shows the depth of their faithlessness. He describes Jesus as the Nazarene and a mighty prophet, not our Lord and Savior and not the Son of God. This is similar to the rich man who approached Jesus wanting to be saved. He did not address Jesus as Lord, but only as good teacher. Jesus recognized this immediately and gave him harsh instructions, knowing that he would not comply. That's out of Luke 18.25. They replied, But we were hoping that it was he who was going to indeed redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things has happened. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb in the early morning and did not find his body, they came and said that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those were with us, went to the tomb, and found it just exactly as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, You foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets that have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer the things and to enter into His glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, He explained to them the things concerning Himself in all the Scriptures. Even though Jesus had gone through everything that He had gone through, even though He had defeated death and come back, He had spent all this time with the disciples. He heard their faithlessness and even frustrated, He started all over. Jesus walked seven miles with these men. It was seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. That's at least a two-hour walk. And within that two-hour period, He started all over again and brought them back from complete faithlessness to complete faith again through His Word. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it's getting towards the evening, and uh, the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them, and he had reclined at the table with them. He took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him immediately, he vanished. Now, the significance of this, first of all, is that they wanted him to come in. Some translations say that they nearly forced him to come into the house. They insisted strongly that he stay with them. Now, what does that mean? They're walking in disbelief. They find a man on a road. They walk at least two hours with him as he teaches them all of the scriptures and the prophets all the way up to present and everything that Jesus had said. They felt in their hearts 
that this man had the knowledge of God. They were looking for the next big thing. They weren't relying on what they already had. They were relying on what was right in front of them. They wanted to hang on to him and to control his movement so that they could stay with him and experience him. Jesus sits down knowing what they're doing and he begins to go through his typical prayer when they sit down to break bread. Why did Jesus choose to appear to two of the lesser known disciples? I believe he realized the negative impact that the couple would have on the city of Emmaus and much further past that. It speaks volumes to the importance of a couple's attitude and relationship and also the power of words. The Bible says that the power of life and death are in the tongue. We really should guard what we say and we should guard how we think. Whatever is in a man's heart is what he is, man or woman. That's what the Scripture says. It wasn't until they experienced His prayer that His blessing, His mannerisms, that they recognized Him. I believe Jesus vanished at that moment because He did not want them to follow His earthly representation, but follow Him in faith and spirit. Verse 32, They said to one another, were our hearts not burning with us within us while He was speaking to us on the road? While He was explaining the Scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven of those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Several things here. They ran back to the eleven disciples to tell them what had happened in Emmaus. Jesus had appeared to Peter separately. There's a very small fragment of scripture that we just read that refers to Simon who they had already reverted back to calling him Simon instead of Peter, which is who Jesus had begun calling him. So we have Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, Joanna, the fourth woman that was with them at the tomb, John, who he got there before Peter did and immediately believed and then he had gone home and come back. You've got Peter who went, didn't believe and still wandered. He went home and at some point Jesus appeared to Peter separately because he told them that he had seen Jesus. You've got Cleopas and Cleopas' uh, companion. All believing that is the count of eight. Minus Judas, of course. You've got the uh, other disciples that are nine that were in the room still not believing. So half the room believed and the other half of the room disbelieved. Do you think the room was uh, loud and arguing and full of emotion? I imagine that you could probably not even hear yourself think. Jesus must have appeared to Peter at some point after he saw the tomb. And it's important to note that throughout the following events from the, this point, Peter remained silent. Peter was the leader. He would be known as the founder of the church. He preached the first sermon and uh, was known for holding and was not known for holding his tongue. Yet in the midst of all of this, Peter remained silent. Jesus appearing separately uh, to Peter signifies Peter's importance in God's plan. Solidifying Peter's faith was important to Jesus. Peter must have felt extreme guilt for denying Jesus and losing faith. 
Jesus used him greatly even after all of those disappointments. That is such a good news for all of us today. Verse 36, While they were telling these things, He Himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. I would say with an exclamation point at the end of that. Jesus probably had to shout it in the midst of all of the, uh, of the arguing. They were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do you doubt? Why do your doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet? That is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, and you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe, it was because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, You got anything to eat? <laughs> So they gave him some broiled fish, and he took it. They were afraid in his presence. This is an exa another example of faithlessness. The final and possibly most extreme example of their faithlessness. Even after hearing the testimonies of half of the room, seeing Jesus alive right before their eyes, combined with all that Jesus had taught them, they were afraid in His presence. Now, He said to them, These are My words which I, speak, I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things which are written about Me in the Law of Moses and Prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. He opened their minds to understanding the Scriptures. Before that, they did not understand and their minds were closed. Their faith was beginning to build. Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of My Father to you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power of on high. Now consider this. Their faith had been built. They have been given the most important, massive news ever given to anybody in the whole history of mankind, and they were told to sit still, be quiet, and wait. Can you imagine the frustration that that must have had? Just as he did on the road to Emmaus, he went back to the beginning and taught them all of the scriptures and prophecies over again. He opened their minds to the scriptures and gave them promise and instruction. Jesus did not judge them or condemn them or smite them. He simply overlooked their flaws and started back at the beginning. He solidified the foundation and built the church. the ascension. And He led them out as far as Bethany, and He lifted up His hands and blessed them. While He was blessing them, He parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping Him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Bethany is approximately two miles outside of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus at any point could have appeared before Herod. He could have appeared before Pilate. He could have floated over the city of Jerusalem and shown Himself to everyone that He had risen. But He did not. He kept it quiet. He only ever appeared any time after His resurrection to the disciples and no one else. Bethany was where Lazarus died and was resurrected. Consider the significance of Jesus ascending where He once resurrected Lazarus. Bethany is on the southeastern slope of the Mount of Olives. Consider the many things that happened there and their relation to the ascension. Jesus is so good to constantly forgive us and bestow His grace and mercy upon us. 
His love is so obvious and His guidance is so necessary. Even though the disciples had so quickly lost their faith and taking their eyes off of Him, He did not hesitate to get them back on the right path and further charge them with instructions for His glory and the deliverance of the gospel. With their renewal of faith, they continue to praise Him long after He ascended. Knowing Jesus. Think of a person or people in your life that are dearest to you. A husband, a wife, a mother, and of course a child. We know their presence when they enter the room, even without saying a word. We know their mannerisms, how they speak, how they walk, and we can tell it is them walking through the house just by the pattern of their footsteps. When we are with them, our demeanor changes. The tone of our and pitch of our voices change, becoming softer and more familiar. Our facial expressions change and we address them as we address them. We feel an instant comfort when we are with them. We miss them when they are apart and they are never far from our thoughts. If we are asked what they would say or feel about any topic, we would immediately know, because we know them so well, what their reactions would be. We know their likes and their dislikes. We feel close to them. And even though we cannot see them or hear them, we love them more than ourselves. This is how Jesus loves us. And this is how we should love Him. He knows us this way because He spends every minute with us. He loves us despite of our faults because we are His. We can only love and know Jesus the way we would love one by making Him a loved one. The most beloved of all, how do, how do we do this? We do this in a quiet prayer in His Word. And He will speak to us. We feel His presence and direction. We learn His voice. We know His footsteps. We feel His hand on our shoulder. In the midst of troubles, we know what He says in the different circumstances. When we are with Him, our demeanor changes. Our eyes and voices soften and our expressions change as we address Him. We feel an instant comfort in His presence and we and He will never leave us knowing in knowing Jesus. We will never miss His presence unless we are looking away from Him. Hebrews 13, 5 and Matthew 28, 20 explain this. This is a diagram that I had uh, learned back when I was in management training years ago. And this is a diagram done by Stephen Covey, which describes the typical response of uh, people in a crisis or in difficulties and uh, where their attentions go. The smaller circle uh, represents the things that we can control in our lives, the things that we focus on typically uh, that actually have a, the ability to change. The larger circle are the things that we have no control over and the things that we cannot change. The problem is, is that what we mostly do, whether in the general world or even in our spiritual relationship, is that we spend most of our energy and our time on the larger circle, which are the things that we can't control and the things that we have uh, no ability to change 
instead of the things that we can. But once we shift our thinking, whether it be in the, the, the real natural world or in the spiritual world, and we focus on the things of God and the relationship we have with Jesus by faith, what we find is that the smaller circle becomes larger and it becomes uh, a larger area covering more and more of the circle of concern. The bigger things that we couldn't affect before now suddenly are being affected. But it doesn't start out in the world. It starts in here and goes out. It doesn't come from the outside in. We must focus and pay attention to the Lord and our relationship with Him. And by doing that, He, through us, will change all things around us. We must know Him by faith, Hebrews 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We must move in faith. We must live in faith. As a fish is made to swim in water, we are made by faith. We are creatures of faith when we have been renewed and made a new creature in Christ Jesus. We were made of faith. So we must exercise within the faith that God has given us. We must submit ourselves before God. We must humble ourselves and we must get into the Word of God. You must submit and seek Him. I guarantee you, any of us without Christ, on our own efforts, as long as we think that we can continue to exist and eke by in this life without God, guess what? That's exactly what's going to happen. Once we completely submit to God and we seek Him out is the first step in moving in faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So, being in the Word and renewing your minds, even though your spirit has been saved and sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you still have to renew your mind daily. Because your flesh is still on the old operating system. It still wants to do the things that it wants to do. Now, your nature has changed. You have a new nature and you're a new creature. But your tendencies without renewing in the Word of God, will want to revert back. And thus the struggle begins. God wants us to take Him at His Word by being in His Word, not relying on physical results or feelings. We must acknowledge His presence, which emboldens us to minister to others. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Knowing Him in His presence we know that all gifts and blessings are already given for His glory and His purposes. That's in Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's already been done. All of the blessings, all the benefits of the kingdom of God are available to us right now if we access them in faith. We must believe the promises of God. But before we can believe them, we have to know what they are. There are many blessings available. The only way you know this is by spending time in the Word and renewing your mind daily. Knowing Him, we must begin using what has already been given to us instead of looking for the next thing, as Cleopas and his companion did. That's in Philemon 1.6. And I, pay, I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you. Not every good thing that would be in you, or could possibly be in you, but as a child of God and a creation of the Holy Spirit, a new creature, all these things are already in you. Every good thing which is in you. For Christ's sake, we must all include our desire for these revelations in our prayers.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your gates with thanksgiving. You are a gracious God, and we would not have or be any of the things that we are without you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the ability to still be in a country where we can freely assemble, where we can freely praise you and worship you, and we pray that you would continue to embolden us to make that a reality. We thank you, Father, for all the many blessings, answered prayers, and provisions that you give moment by moment in our lives. We thank you for the things that are small yet powerful that you show us in our lives when we can be still and know that you are God. We praise your name, Father, for being the Alpha and the Omega, the Creator of all things, the beginning and the end. We praise your name for your love your grace, your mercies, your forgiveness, and all the many things that you bestow upon us. Father, we ask that you would continue to guide us and direct us. We ask that you give us revelation in this time of the final harvest of the souls that's coming, Father. We ask that you give us revelations, open our eyes and our ears so that we may see your movements, that we may hear your words in our heart, and that we may follow your instructions. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you are. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.